The Symposium by Plato, written in approximately 385 B.C., translated by Benjamin Jowett. The Symposium is a philosophical dialogue written by Plato on the nature of love, taking the form of a series of speeches given by a group of men at a symposium or drinking party at the house of the tragedian Agathon at Athens. The following excerpt is Socrates' speech on love, which he delivered at the symposium. And now, said Socrates, I will ask about love. Is love of something or of nothing? Of something, surely, Agathon replied. Keep in mind what this is, and tell me what I want to know. Whether love desires that of which love is? Yes, surely. And does he possess, or does he not possess, that which he loves and desires? Probably not, I should say. Nay, replied Socrates, I would have you consider whether necessarily is not rather the word. The inference that he who desires something is in want of something, and that he who desires nothing is in want of nothing, is in my judgment, Agathon, absolutely and necessarily true. What do you think? I agree with you, said Agathon. Very good. Would he who is great desire to be great, or he who is strong desire to be strong? That would be inconsistent with our previous admissions. True, for he who is anything cannot want to be that which he is. Very true. And yet, added Socrates, if a man being strong desired to be strong, or being swift desired to be swift, or being healthy desired to be healthy, in that case he might be thought to desire something which he already has or is. I give the example in order that we may avoid misconception. For the possessors of these qualities, Agathon, must be supposed to have their respective advantages at the time, whether they choose or not. And who can desire that which he has? Therefore, when a person says, I am well and wish to be well, or I am rich and wish to be rich, and I desire simply to have what I have, to him we shall reply, You, my friend, having wealth and health and strength, want to have the continuance of them, for at this moment, whether you choose or no, you have them. And when you say, I desire that which I have and nothing else, is not your meaning that you want to have what you now have in the future? He must agree with us, must he not? He must, replied Agathon. Then, said Socrates, he desires that what he has at present may be preserved to him in the future, which is equivalent to saying that he desires something which is non-existent to him, and which as yet he has not got. Very true, he said. Then he and every one who desires, desires that which he has not already, and which is future and not present, and which he has not and is not, and of which he is in want. These are the sort of things which love and desire seek. Very true, he said. Then now, said Socrates, let us recapitulate the argument. First, is not love of something, and of something too which is wanting to a man? Yes, he replied. Remember further what you said in your speech, or if you do not remember, I will remind you. You said that the love of the beautiful set in order the empire of the gods. For that of deformed things there is no love. Did you not say something of that kind? Yes, said Agathon. Yes, my friend, and the remark was a just one. And if this is true, love is the love of beauty and not of deformity. He assented. And the admission has already been made that love is of something which a man wants and has not. True, he said. Then love wants and has not beauty. Certainly, Agathon replied. And could you call that beautiful which wants and does not possess beauty? Certainly not. Then would you still say that love is beautiful? Agathon replied, I fear that I do not understand what I was saying. You made a good speech, Agathon, replied Socrates, but there is yet one small question which I would fain ask. Is not the good also the beautiful? Yes. Then in wanting the beautiful, love wants also the good. I cannot refute you, Socrates, said Agathon. Let us assume that what you say is true. Say rather, beloved Agathon, that you cannot refute the truth. 
for Socrates is easily refuted. And now, taking my leave of you, I would rehearse a tale of love which I heard from Diotima of Mantinea, a woman wise in this and in many other kinds of knowledge, who in the days of old, when the Athenians offered sacrifice, before the coming of the plague, delayed the disease ten years. She was my instructress in the art of love, and I shall repeat to you what she said to me, beginning with the admissions made by Agathon, which are nearly, if not quite the same, which I made to the wise woman when she questioned me. I think that this will be the easiest way, and I shall take both parts myself as well I can. As you, Agathon, suggested, I must speak first of the being and nature of love, and then of his works. First I said to her, in nearly the same words which he used to me, that love was a mighty God, and likewise fair. And she proved to me, as I proved to him, that by my own showing, love was neither fair nor good. What do you mean, Diotima, I said? Is love then evil and foul? Hush, she cried. Must that be foul which is not fair? Certainly, I said. And is that which is not wise ignorant? Do you not see that there is a mean between wisdom and ignorance? And what might that be, I said? Right opinion, she replied, which, as you know, being incapable of giving a reason is not knowledge, for how can knowledge be devoid of reason? Nor again ignorance, for neither can ignorance attain the truth, but is clearly something which is a mean between ignorance and wisdom. Quite true, I replied. Do not insist, she said, that what is not fair is of necessity foul, or what is not good evil, or infer that because love is not fair and good, he is therefore foul and evil, for he is in a mean between them. Well, I said, love is surely admitted by all to be a great God. By those who know, or by those who do not know? By all. <laughs> and how, Socrates, she said with a smile, can love be acknowledged to be a great god by those who say that he is not a god at all? And who are they? I said. You and I are two of them, she replied. How can that be? I said. It is quite intelligible, she replied, for you yourself would acknowledge that the gods are happy and fair. Of course you would. Would you dare to say that any god was not? Certainly not, I replied. And you mean by the happy, those who are the possessors of things good or fair? Yes. And you admitted that love, because he was in want, desires those good and fair things of which he is in want? Yes, I did. But how can he be a god who has no portion in what is either good or fair? Impossible. Then you see that you also deny the divinity of love. What then is love, I asked? Is he mortal? No. What then? As in the former instance, he is neither mortal nor immortal, but in a mean between the two. What is he, Diotima? He is a great spirit, and like all spirits, he is intermediate between the divine and the mortal. And what, I said, is his power? He interprets, she replied, between gods and men conveying and taking across to the gods the prayers and sacrifices of men, and to men the commands and replies of the gods. He is the mediator who spans the chasm which divides them, and therefore in him all is bound together, and through him the arts of the prophet and the priest, their sacrifices and mysteries and charms, and all prophecy and incantation find their way. For God mingles not with man, but through love, all the intercourse and converse of God with man, whether awake or asleep, is carried on. The wisdom which understands this is spiritual. All other wisdom, such as that of arts and handicrafts, is mean and vulgar. Now these spirits or intermediate powers are many and diverse, and one of them is love. And who, I said, was his father and who his mother? The tale, she said, will take time. Nevertheless, I will tell you. On the birthday of Aphrodite there was a feast of the gods, at which the god Porus, or Plenty, who is the son of Metis, or Discretion, was one of the guests. When the feast was over, Penia, or Poverty, 
as the manner is on such occasions, came about the doors to beg. Now Plenty, who was the worst for nectar, there was no wine in those days, went into the garden of Zeus and fell into a heavy sleep. And Poverty, considering her own straitened circumstances, plotted to have a child by him. And accordingly she lay down at his side and conceived love, who partly because he is naturally a lover of the beautiful, and because Aphrodite is herself beautiful, and also because he was born on her birthday, is her follower and attendant. And as his parentage is, so also are his fortunes. In the first place he is always poor, and anything but tender and fair as the many imagine him. And he is rough and squalid, and has no shoes, nor a house to dwell in. On the bare earth exposed he lies under the open heaven. In the streets or at the doors of houses, taking his rest, and like his mother he is always in distress. Like his father, too, whom he also partly resembles, he is always plotting against the fair and good. He is bold, enterprising, strong, a mighty hunter, always weaving some intrigue or other, keen in the pursuit of wisdom, fertile in resources, a philosopher at all times, terrible as an enchanter, sorcerer, sophist. He is by nature neither mortal nor immortal, but alive and flourishing at one moment when he is in plenty, and dead at another moment, and again alive by reason of his father's nature. But that which is always flowing in is always flowing out, and so he is never in want and never in wealth, and further he is in a mean between ignorance and knowledge. The truth of the matter is this. No god is a philosopher or seeker after wisdom, for he is wise already. Nor does any man who is wise seek after wisdom. Neither do the ignorant seek after wisdom, for herein is the evil of ignorance, that he who is neither good nor wise is nevertheless satisfied with himself. He has no desire for that of which he feels no want. But who then, Diotima, I said, are the lovers of wisdom, if they are neither the wise nor the foolish? <laughs> a child may answer that question, she replied. They are those who are in a mean between the two. Love is one of them. For wisdom is a most beautiful thing, and love is of the beautiful. And therefore, love is also a philosopher or lover of wisdom, and being a lover of wisdom is in a mean between the wise and the ignorant. And of this, too, his birth is the cause, for his father is wealthy and wise, and his mother poor and foolish. Such, my dear Socrates, is the nature of the spirit love. The error in your conception of him was very natural, and as I imagine from what you say, has arisen out of a confusion of love and the beloved, which made you think that love was all beautiful. For the beloved is the truly beautiful, and delicate, and perfect, and blessed. But the principle of love is of another nature, and is such as I have described. I said, O oh, thou stranger woman, thou sayest well, but assuming love to be such as you say, what is the use of him to men? That, Socrates, she replied, I will attempt to unfold. Of his nature and birth I have already spoken, and you acknowledge that love is of the beautiful. But someone will say, Of the beautiful in what, Socrates and Diotima? Or rather, let me put the question more clearly and ask, When a man loves the beautiful, what does he desire? I answered her, That the beautiful may be his. Still, she said, the answer suggests a further question. What is given by the possession of beauty? To what you have asked, I replied. I have no answer ready. Then, she said, let me put the word good in the place of the beautiful and repeat the question once more. If he who loves, loves the good, what is it then that he loves? The possession of the good, I said. And what does he gain who possesses the good? Happiness, I replied. There is less difficulty in answering that question. Yes, she said. The happy are made happy by the acquisition of good things. Nor is there any need to ask why a man desires happiness. The answer is already final. You are right, I said. And is this wish and this desire common to all? And do all men always desire their own good, or only some men? What say you? You are right, I said. 
And is this wish and this desire common to all? And do all men always desire their own good, or only some men? What say you? All men, I replied. The desire is common to all. Why then, she rejoined, are not all men, Socrates, said to love, but only some of them? whereas you say that all men are always loving the same things. I myself wonder, I said, why this is. There is nothing to wonder at, she replied. The reason is that one part of love is separated off and receives the name of the whole, but the other parts have other names. Give an illustration, I said. She answered me as follows. There is poetry, which, as you know, is complex and manifold, all creation or passage of non-being into being is poetry, or making. And the processes of all art are creative. And the master of arts are all poets, or makers. Very true. Still, she said, you know that they are not called poets, but have other names. Only that portion of the art which is separated off from the rest, and is concerned with music and meter, is termed poetry. And they who possess poetry in this sense of the word are called poets. Very true, I said. And the same holds for love. For you may say generally that all desire of good and happiness is only the great and subtle power of love, but they who are drawn towards him by any other path, whether the path of money-making or gymnastics or philosophy, are not called lovers. The name of the whole is appropriated to those whose affection takes one form only, they alone are said to love, or be lovers. I dare say, I replied, that you are right. Yes, she added, and you hear people say that lovers are seeking for their other half, but I say that they are seeking neither for the half of themselves, nor for the whole, unless the half or the whole be also a good, and they will cut off their own hands and feet and cast them away if they are evil. For they love not what is their own, unless perchance there be someone who calls what belongs to him the good, and what belongs to another the evil. For there is nothing which men love but the good. Is there anything? Certainly, I should say, that there is nothing. Then, she said, the simple truth is that men love the good. Yes, I said, to which must be added that they love the possession of the good. Yes, that must be added. And not only the possession, but the everlasting possession of the good. That must be added, too. Then love, she said, may be described generally as the love of the everlasting possession of the good. That is most true. Then if this be the nature of love, can you tell me further, she said, what is the manner of the pursuit? What are they doing who show all this eagerness and heat which is called love? And what is the object which they have in view? Answer me. Nay, Diotima, I replied, if I had known I should not have wondered at your wisdom. Neither should I have come to learn from you about this very matter. Well, she said, I will teach you. The object which they have in view is birth in beauty, whether of body or soul. I do not understand you, I said. The oracle requires an explanation. I will make my meaning clear, she replied. I mean to say that all men are bringing to the birth in their bodies and in their souls. There is a certain age at which human nature is desirous of procreation, procreation which must be in beauty and not in deformity. And this procreation is the union of man and woman, and is a divine thing, for conception and generation are an immortal principle in the mortal creature, and in the inharmonious they can never be. But the deformed is always inharmonious with the divine, and the beautiful harmonious. Beauty, then, is the destiny or goddess of parturition, who presides at birth, and therefore, when approaching beauty, the conceiving power is propitious and diffusive and benign, and begets and bears fruit. At the sight of ugliness she frowns and contracts and has a sense of pain, and turns away and shrivels up and not without a pang refrains from conception. And this is the reason why, when the hour of conception arrives, and the teeming nature is full, there is such a flutter and ecstasy about beauty, whose approach is the alleviation of the pain of travail. For love, Socrates, is not, as you imagine, the love of the beautiful only. What then? 
the love of generation and of birth in beauty. Yes, I said. Yes, indeed, she replied. But why of generation? Because to the mortal creature generation is a sort of eternity and immortality, she replied. And if, as has already been admitted, love is of the everlasting possession of the good, all men will necessarily desire immortality together with good. Wherefore love is of immortality. All this she taught me at various times when she spoke of love, and I remember her once saying to me, What is the cause, Socrates, of love and the attendant desire? See you not how all animals, birds as well as beasts, in their desire of procreation, are in agony when they take the infection of love, which begins with the desire of union, whereto is added the care of offspring, on whose behalf the weakest are ready to battle against the strongest, even to the uttermost, and to die for them, and will let themselves be tormented with hunger or suffer anything in order to maintain their young. Man may be supposed to act thus from reason, but why should animals have these passionate feelings? Can you tell me why? Again I replied that I did not know. She said to me, and do you expect ever to become a master in the art of love if you do not know this? But I have already told you, dear Tima, that my ignorance is the reason why I come to you, for I am conscious that I want a teacher. Tell me then the cause of this and of the other mysteries of love. Marvel not, she said, if you believe that love is of the immortal, as we have several times acknowledged, for here again, and on the same principle too, the mortal nature is seeking as far as is possible to be everlasting and immortal. And this is only to be attained by generation, because generation always leaves behind a new existence in place of the old. Nay, even in the life of the same individual, there is succession and not absolute unity. A man is called the same, and yet in the short interval which elapses between youth and age, and which every animal is said to have life and identity, he is undergoing a perpetual process of loss and reparation. Hair, flesh, bones, blood, and the whole body are always changing. Which is true not only of the body, but also of the soul, whose habits, tempers, opinions, desires, pleasures, pains, fears, never remain the same in any one of us, but are always coming and going, and equally true of knowledge. And what is still more surprising to us mortals, not only do the sciences in general spring up and decay, so that in respect of them we are never the same, but each of them individually experiences a like change. For what is implied in the word recollection but the departure of knowledge, which is ever being forgotten, and is renewed and preserved by recollection, and appears to be the same although in reality new, according to that law of succession by which all mortal things are preserved? not absolutely the same, but by substitution, the old worn-out mortality leaving another new and similar existence behind, unlike the divine, which is always the same and not another. In this way, Socrates, the mortal body, or mortal anything, partakes of immortality, but the immortal in another way. Marvel not then at love, which all men have of their offspring, for that universal love and interest is for the sake of immortality. I was astonished at her words, and said, Is this really true, O thou wise Diotima? And she answered with all the authority of an accomplished sophist, Of that, Socrates, you may be assured. Think only of the ambition of men, and you will wonder at the senselessness of their ways, unless you consider how they are stirred by the love of an immortality of fame. They are ready to run all risks greater far than they would have run for their children, and to spend money and undergo any sort of toil, and even to die, for the sake of leaving behind them a name which shall be eternal. Do you imagine that Alcestes would have died to save Admetus, or Achilles to avenge Patroclus, or your own Codrus in order to preserve the kingdom for his sons, if they had not imagined that the memory of their virtues, which still survives among us, would be immortal? Nay, she said. I am persuaded that all men do all things, and the better they are, the more they do them, in the hope of the glorious fame of immortal virtue, for they desire the immortal. Those who are pregnant in the body only, betake themselves to women, and beget children. This is the character of their love, 
their offspring, as they hope, will preserve their memory, and giving them the blessedness and immortality which they desire in the future. But souls which are pregnant, for there certainly are men who are more creative in their souls than in their bodies, conceive that which is proper for the soul to conceive or contain. And what are these conceptions? Wisdom and virtue in general. And such creators are poets, and all artists who are deserving of the name inventor. But the greatest and fairest sort of wisdom, by far, is that which is concerned with the ordering of states and families, and which is called temperance and justice. And he who in youth has the seed of these implanted in him, and is himself inspired, when he comes to maturity desires to beget and generate. He wanders about seeking beauty that he may beget offspring. For in deformity he will beget nothing, and naturally embraces the beautiful rather than the deformed body. Above all, when he finds a fair and noble and well-nurtured soul, he embraces the two in one person, and to such a one he is full of speech about virtue and the nature and pursuits of a good man, and he tries to educate him, and at the touch of the beautiful which is ever present to his memory, even when absent, he brings forth that which he had conceived long before, and in company with him tends that which he brings forth. And they are married by a far nearer tie, and have a closer friendship than those who beget mortal children. For the children who are their common offspring are fairer and more immortal. Who, when he thinks of Homer and Hesiod and other great poets, would not rather have their children than ordinary human ones? Who would not emulate them in the creation of children such as theirs? which have preserved their memory and given them everlasting glory? Or who would not have children as Lycurgus left behind him to be the saviors, not only of Lacedaemon, but of Hellas, as one may say? There is Solon, too, who is the revered father of Athenian laws, and many others there are in many other places, both among Hellenes and barbarians, who have given to the world many noble works, and have been the parents of virtue of every kind and many temples have been raised in their honour for the sake of children such as theirs, which were never raised in honour of any one for the sake of his mortal children. These are the lesser mysteries of love, into which even you, Socrates, may enter, to the greater and more hidden ones which are the crown of these, and to which, if you pursue them in the right spirit, they will lead. I know not whether you will be able to attain, but I will do my utmost to inform you, and do you follow if you can. For he who would proceed aright in this matter should begin in youth to visit beautiful forms, and first, if he be guided by his instructor aright, to love one such form only. Out of that he should create fair thoughts, and soon he will himself perceive that of beauty of one form is akin to the beauty of another. And then, if beauty of form in general is his pursuit, how foolish would he be not to recognize that beauty in every form is one and the same? And when he perceives this, he will abate his violent love of the one, which he will despise and deem a small thing, and will become a lover of all beautiful forms. In the next stage he will consider that the beauty of the mind is more honourable than the beauty of the outward form, so that if a virtuous soul have but a little comeliness, he will be content to love and tend him, and will search out and bring to the birth thoughts which may improve the young, until he is compelled to contemplate and see the beauty of institutions and laws, and to understand that the beauty of them all is of one family, and that personal beauty is a trifle. And after laws and institutions he will go on to the sciences, that he may see their beauty. Being not like a servant in love with the beauty of one youth or man or institution, himself a slave, mean and narrow-minded, but drawing towards and contemplating the vast sea of beauty, he will create many fair and noble thoughts and notions in boundless love of wisdom, until on that shore he grows and waxes strong, and at last the vision is revealed to him of a single science, which is the science of beauty everywhere. To this I will proceed. Please to give me your best attention." He who has been instructed thus far in the things of love, and who has learned to see the beautiful in due order and succession, when he comes toward the end, will suddenly perceive a nature of wondrous beauty. And this, Socrates, is the final cause of all our former toils. 
a nature which in the first place is everlasting, not growing and decaying or waxing and waning. Secondly, not fair in one point of view and foul in another, or at one time or in one relation or at one place fair, at another time or in another relation or at another place foul, as if fair to some and foul to others, or in the likeness of a face or hands or any other part of the bodily frame, or in any form of speech or knowledge or existing in another human being, as, for example, in an animal, or in heaven, or in earth, or in any other place, but beauty absolute, separate, simple, and everlasting, which without diminution and without increase, or any change, is imparted to the ever-growing and perishing beauties of all other things. He who from these, ascending under the influence of true love, begins to perceive that beauty is not far from the end, and the true order of going or being led by another to the things of love is to begin from the beauties of earth and mount upwards for the sake of that other beauty, using these as steps only, and from one going on to two, and from two to all fair forms, and from fair forms to fair practices, and from fair practices to fair notions, until from fair notions he arrives at the notion of absolute beauty and at last knows what the essence of beauty is. This, my dear Socrates, said the stranger of Mantinea, is that life above all others which man should live in the contemplation of beauty absolute, a beauty which if you once beheld, you would see not to be after the measure of gold and garments and fair boys and youths, whose presence now entrances you, and you and many a one would be content to live seeing them only, and conversing with them without meat or drink. If that were possible, you only want to look at them and to be with them. But what if man had eyes to see the true beauty, the divine beauty, I mean pure and clear and unalloyed, not clogged with the pollutions of mortality and all the colors and vanities of human life, thither looking and holding converse with the true beauty simple and divine, Remember how in that communion only, beholding beauty with the eye of the mind, he will be enabled to bring forth not images of beauty, but realities. For he has hold not of an image, but of a reality, and bringing forth and nourishing true virtue to become the friend of God, and be immortal, if mortal man may. Would that be an ignoble life? Such, Phaedrus, and I speak not only to you, but to all of you, were the words of Diotima, and I am persuaded of their truth. And being persuaded of them, I try to persuade others, that in the attainment of this end, human nature will not easily find a helper better than love. And therefore, also, I say that every man ought to honor him, as I myself honor him, and walk in his ways, and exhort others to do the same, and praise the power and spirit of love, according to the measure of my ability, now and ever. The words which I have spoken to you, Phaedrus, may call an iconium of love, or anything else which you please. 